So my name's Preston Hall. Usually with me is Linda DeMarler. Uh, we're a mother and son team who, from Tax Masters. We're here in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, th- we've been in business for over 50 years. And uh, both, both Linda and I got our start in real estate. So uh, she was doing uh, commercial real estate here in Bethesda, Maryland. I was doing uh, real estate over in Dubai, which is where Linda is now. And I did some real estate in Miami. I was pr- primarily uh, handling residential real estate. And um, so we know what real estate uh, agents go through and what uh, real estate investors go through uh, trying to not only keep their life in order, but their, their tax life in order. And so we, we have always approached everything from a real estate angle. Uh, and almost all of our clients here are either realtors, real estate investors, or uh, we also do some international issues as well with DC being, you know, uh, so transient and, and we've got diplomats coming in and, and what have you. So uh, we, we've also uh, handled a, a lot of international issues over, over the years as well. <clears throat> uh, that gentleman was saying how he's looking for tax help. And yeah, it's really, it's really tough to find almost uh, a, all the, uh, you know, potential new clients I have coming in the door these days. Are, are telling me my accountant just up and quit or my accountant's retired or, um, and, and, and what's funny is it, we, used to, we used to say, you know, if you, ever, if, if you ever have a potential client coming in and, and they're saying that their accountant's retired, um, it's usually code for, you know, the, the accountant was too afraid to, uh, to fire them. And so they pretended to be, to, to be quitting the game or, or what have you. But these days, it, it, it's, it's uh, actually happening. A, a lot of people are just getting out of it. Found out uh, five or six years ago, I found out that a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot more accounts were leaving tax accounting than going into it. And it's been really hard for, uh, for me to find uh, good accountants to add to the team. And, and so the last few uh, that we've done in the last five or six years, we're, we're bringing in young people and developing them over the course of a few years, as opposed to bringing in seasoned accountants, because uh, it's, it, it, it's just really tough to find accountants. So um, if, if you do have a good accountant, stick with them, please. Uh, we're, uh, as many accounting firms, we're, we're really not um, uh, taking on uh, many new clients these days. At, at this time of year, we, we end up uh, firing, you know, any, any of our terrible clients and, and we, we might be bringing in, you know, a, a, a couple here and there, but for the most part, uh, yeah, we're, we're not looking for clients either, which, uh, you know, the good news is I, I'm not here to do the hard sell. I'm, I'm, I'm just here to, to help educate you folks and, uh, and to answer questions. Linda and I love doing this. Uh, you know, it gives us a little break from, from running the company. Although Linda's, Linda's basically retired at this point. And, and so she does education and, and, and I step in and help as well. Um, so we're here to, we're here to help you folks. And, uh, and, you know, we just love getting out there and talking to people. This is kind of a cool thing. I've, I've never, we've done a lot of zoom meetings, of course, uh, uh, over the past year or so, but I've never done a zoom meeting where I'm also pre- presenting to a classroom, uh, of course, we've presented to classrooms before, but never a Zoom meeting to a classroom. So kind of kind of a cool little little thing here. And and hopefully uh, uh, I can answer some questions from the classroom as well as the people on Zoom here along the way. Um, I last uh, last last speech I gave. Usually I love interruptions, but uh, uh, and I love people asking questions along the way. But let's we're going to hold them till the end today. Um, uh, cause every once in a while you get that one person who has you know, like 15 questions and, and won't let us get to stuff that is going to answer their questions. <laughs> so, um, we will, uh, I'll get, I'll be happy to, uh, you know, stay on and, and take everybody's questions along the way. And, uh, and I won't BS you if I don't know the answer either, you know, we'll figure out a way to get back to you, or I can put you in touch with somebody in my office who works with whatever type of issue that you um uh that you're that you have a question about so let's see here go on to my next slide here uh and so we like to start off with a little quote 
um, from Albert Einstein and that it, he said that the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. And so uh, one of the reasons we, we present this is it, when Albert Einstein came to the United States, uh, he was sent his uh, tax forms to fill out. And uh, after a few hours of trying to figure it out, he just crumpled it up, put it in the envelope and said, you all figure this out. This is ridiculous. And, and that's not to say that he wasn't a genius, because, of course, he was. Um, that's just to say that it's not it wasn't his specialty. And uh, and, you know, if anyone here is smarter than Albert Einstein and, and you, you can do your own taxes properly and you have the time and the inclination to learn all this. Fantastic. Um, because, <laughs> as we said, a lot of accountants aren't taking on people, but really, uh, especially when it comes to real estate investing uh, and uh, those of you who are realtors as well, uh, it's, it's important that you have good tax help along the way because you can get into some really, um, uh, some really, really bad trouble uh, and, and, you know, just run yourself bankrupt if you, if you don't have good help along the way. So if you, uh, if you think a bad accountant's, uh, what, what is it? A, a bad accountant is, uh, much more expensive than a good accountant <laughs> in the long run, because once you get into those tax troubles, whew, forget about it. Um, and so when, when Linda and I were putting this together yesterday, um, I, I wanted to speak to some things that, uh, you know, because a lot of times people, when we do presentations, they'll come up and they'll start asking us questions and, and they're working under the premise that um, what they hear in the news is what the tax laws are. And I've, uh, I've been sitting watching the news, whether it's financial news or, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which news station, and they'll bring on tax experts, people who are tax accountants, and I hear them give blatantly wrong advice. Um, so, and, and that's when a law is actually passed. Uh, a lot of times, everything you hear on the news as far as tax laws and what's going on, a lot of times, the, it, What's salacious and fun to talk about is the stuff that people have proposed but hasn't actually passed. And so uh, it, uh, people get confused and they think that, you know, they can't write off this or they can write off that or they can use this tax strategy because they've been hearing it in the news so much. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, you know, so we put this slide together uh, called tax law changes versus fake news. And so one of the things you may have heard about is that you know Congress is getting is going to do away with 1031 exchanges or like kind exchanges, and I know you all are an investor group, so you you know what uh, 1031 exchange is. Uh, there was talk earlier this year that under the uh, under the new proposals that they may get rid of the 1031 exchange, and anybody who did one in 2021, it would also be unwound. Uh, and that uh, that they were going to do away with it. None of this is passed. Uh, it's uh, it definitely won't pass by the, it, it, any of these proposals. Uh, won't happen uh, before the end of this year. They they don't have time. There, it's not in any of the pending bills, as far as I know. Uh, and it's uh, it would be fairly unpopular. And the reason is is that Congress, for the most part. The U.S. government wants people investing in real estate. They want people tied down to, you know, what is believed to be a more uh, uh, safe investment. Uh, that's also another thing that people were talking about around the same time was uh, eliminating stepped up basis. And for those of you not familiar with stepped up basis, it's when you inherit a property, you... Uh, you get a stepped up basis in that the person who uh, you inherited it from, let's say that they purchased that property at $100,000. Now, on their date of death, that property is worth a million dollars and you inherit that property. Your basis is whatever the property was worth at the date of death. So your basis is now a million dollars. And what that, that's important because if you go to sell the property, let's say a year later, you sell the property for $1.1 million. You only pay taxes on $100,000 in that case. Or uh, if you sold it for $900,000, you would have a personal loss of $100,000. Um, uh, so it, 
there was talk earlier this year of eliminating the stepped up basis uh, uh, provisions. And, uh, and this is one of those things that uh, you really haven't heard much about uh, the last couple months under the, the new uh, um, bills going through Congress. And I would say that this is one of those things that's really likely not to ever happen. And if it does happen, they'll, they'll be, uh, you know, people will get stuffed up basis up to a few million dollars. Uh, so not, you know, not something that's going to affect 99.9% .9 of people. Um, and so uh, this is not something that I would worry about, even when it they were talking about it. Uh, and there was a lot of political, su supposedly a lot of political will for this to happen. I was definitely not scared that this was going to happen because, you know, every congressman owns property. Every congressman just about has kids that they want to inherit that property and they don't want their kids to have to pay taxes on it. it you, you'll find that a lot of tax laws are written uh, around the same amount of money that your average congressman has. Uh, and so whether it's uh, whether it's um, uh, inheritance taxes, things like that, uh, they're they're basically written so that, you know, the congressman's uh, that um, anybody who inherits money from them isn't going to end up having to pay taxes. Um, now, there are some congressmen and senators who are worth, you know, one hundred million dollars or more. And, and uh, that's a completely different story. <clears throat> so there was also uh, talk of. Uh, eliminating the cap the cap gains rates uh, for taxes and uh, and replacing it with uh, income tax rates. So people who pay tax uh, cap gains rates on whether it's a uh, sale of real estate or um, sale of stocks that that was going to be replaced by uh, your income tax rate, which is typically higher for most people. Um, and so this is something that you know they were talking about it for a week or two, and the stock market started to tank. And so that kind of disappeared from the, uh, the, the discussion. Uh, so these are all things not to be scared of uh, so far. So now <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you a few years ago heard about, uh, you heard a lot about SALT, which is state and local tax and the deductibility of it. Uh, you, we lost a good amount of it uh, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in uh, 2017. And uh, the, the recent talk is uh, and this is this is actually in uh, not the infrastructure bill that passed uh, last week, but the Build Back Better bill, which is the multi-trillion-dollar bill uh, going through Congress right now. Uh, you know, I've heard numbers from uh, it's two trillion dollars to five trillion dollars, whatever. In that bill, there is uh, there's talk of moving the state and local tax deduction from ten thousand dollars up to, I've, heard, I, I've seen 70 and I've seen 80. I've seen these both numbers multiple times. Uh, and so there's talk of doing that. Um, I, you know, if the, if, if the Build Back Better bill uh, passes, then hey, you know, SALT is back for all intents and purposes. The state and local tax deduction is, is back for all intents and purposes. If it doesn't pass, I think there's very likely a good chance that this that some that the salt cap will be raised in the near future, and if I had if I had to bet, my bet is going to be uh, around twenty five thousand. That it'll go from ten thousand dollars that you're able to write off to twenty five thousand dollars. So, um, the uh, let's see here. Uh, th now this is interesting. It, back in twenty seventeen, they they came out with the qualified uh, business income deduction. Uh, which is a 20% deduction, uh, and I'm going to get I'm going to talk more about it later. Uh, at the time, they said real estate investors were not uh, allowed to take uh, advantage of this, and then uh, later on, uh, with some with some minor tweaks and and uh, and some uh, notices from the IRS, they said, okay, yes, um, uh, in certain circumstances, real estate investors can take advantage of QBID which is the qualified business income deduction. Uh, and then of, of interest, because, you know, since I've been doing taxes, um, uh, well, as long as I remember, <clears throat> uh, business meals have always been only 50% deductible. Uh, the, for 2021 and for 2022, if you have a business meal in a restaurant, then you can deduct 100% of that on your taxes. 
And the reason is Congress wants to get people back in restaurants, get people spending money in restaurants to uh, go ahead and attempt to revive restaurants. Um, so uh, here in Montgomery County, where I am in Maryland, uh, the restaurants are empty. Everyone's still getting carry out. Everyone's afraid to go in without a mask. And so, uh, yeah, that's not, it's not working too well here, unfortunately. It is good <laughs> for date night. I can go out to I can go out to dinner with my wife, and we don't need a reservation, and we can always get a table. So that is nice um, here. But uh, I do feel for my my nephew owns two restaurants down in Florida, and and I I know those guys are going through uh, uh, tough times these days. So when tax laws actually change, uh, there's a there's a typically a period of confusion. The media helps out not one bit. Uh, and starts reporting on, on, you know, any expert who's willing to get on television starts talking and, and telling people what they can and cannot do. Um, but the uh, shortly after a law is passed and codified, the IRS uh, comes in and interprets the law. And, uh, and after uh, IRS interprets the law and says what, you know, what people are going to be allowed to do and not allowed to do, uh, sometimes the uh, uh, there will be some outrage or uh, Congress realizes that whatever that whatever has happened is not exactly what they wanted to happen. So uh, Congress will come back and make a couple tweaks um, or the IRS will just change their mind and uh, and they'll send out a written determination letter saying, you know, you can you can do this. Uh, we've decided to, or you can do that. Um, and then. After, after all of that happens, which is the first couple of years after a tax law is changed, uh, taxpayers will, will not listen to IRS guidance um, and, and you know, they'll interpret it their own way. And uh, some people are willing to fight tooth and nail and take it to take it, you know, the issue to court because they see it a different way or their tax attorney sees it a different way. And in those cases, uh, the uh, whoops hold on one second is every can everyone hear me okay still okay great great i was fiddling with my airpods and uh <laughs> and i got a bunch of messages that um my my microphone was off so uh and in a lot of cases the irs will lose a case uh and uh and then the tax laws have to be um uh, have to they have the IRS has to interpret the tax law in a different uh, way based on a case. Sometimes IRS will fight these issues so hard that they'll say, "Well, we lost the case in this jurisdiction over uh, you know," and so any uh, any um, anybody in these states that are under this jurisdiction under this circuit court, uh, we interpret the law that we interpret the law that way because we lost there but the rest of the country uh you know we, we interpret we still believe that we are right and we're interpreting it the other way until uh the case goes to the supreme court um and that actually happened with uh with the uh, realtors a, a few years ago um and i can't even remember what the case was but it was just completely uh absurd so i i put together those two slides all to say don't believe what you hear in the media. Make sure that you're working with a decent accountant who has, you know, understands real estate law, understands how uh, these things are treated. And, uh, and, you know, you also want an accountant that you can communicate with. Don't call them in April and, and start asking questions. And don't call them in October because it's, it's our busiest times of the year. But you should have an accountant that you can communicate with and, and you should be running, you know, purchase decisions or your um, belief of the way the tax law is going to affect you when you're when you're making uh, decisions. You, you do want somebody that you can run that stuff by. Uh, so... Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Um, repairs and improvements. And uh, I understand we have a lot of real estate investors here. So uh, I know you folks do a lot of repairing and a lot of improving. And so what's the difference? Um, with improvements, it's we're, we're doing things that raises the property's value. Um, we're do, or we're, we're, do, we're making large changes to to restore a property to its original condition. 
uh, or we're adapting a property to a completely different use. Um, it, like we're taking a garage and turning it into an office or we're, um, uh, we've got a retail store, you own some commercial real estate, it's a, it's a retail shop and it's now being converted to a restaurant. So these are, these are improvements that you make upon the property. Although turning something into a restaurant these days is probably not an improvement or a good business decision. But, um, uh, but the, these are improvements um, and they are, the difference between an improvement and a repair is that an improvement we have to depreciate over the life of whatever the improvement is. And I'll give you, I'll give you some examples as well. Um, and whereas a repair, if we're repairing something on the property, we are fixing or replacing something that's broken. Um, and so the repair is deductible contemporaneously. You don't have to depreciate the, what you've spent on those repairs over multiple years. You can write it off in the year that you, that you incurred that expense <clears throat> or paid that ex expense. So uh, if we've got, if we have an HVAC system and the HVAC system breaks, then uh, if we go ahead and just pull it out and put an entire new HVAC system in and we put in one of these, uh, you know, we, we switch from a, a gas to an electric system, a heat pump system or whatever, but we take out the old one and we replace it completely with a brand new system. That is an improvement. If the HVAC system breaks and, and you know, your HVAC guy says, look, I can, I can replace the fan and, you know, you've got a fluid leak and I'm going to go ahead and uh, fix those items and it's going to be, you know, a few hundred to a thousand bucks, whatever. Great. That's a repair. And we can write off that repair. Um, uh, we can write off that repair in the year that you spent the money on, on getting the item repaired. So, and that brings us to depreciation. So, when, as real estate investors, we only, um, we only depreciate the buildings and our improvements. We do not uh, depreciate land. So if you went ahead <clears throat> and purchased a property for $300,000, uh, then it, that property, let's say you pull up the tax records and, and it says, oh, about one third of the property is, worth is uh, the land and two thirds of the property is the uh, the building on the land? Then we can write off the uh, the building itself. But we can go ahead and depreciate that over the course of if it's a residential, we do it over 27 and a half years. If it's commercial, we do it over 39 and a half years. Uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> so we would we would write off the cost of that the two hundred thousand dollars over the 27 and a half years. The other $100,000, the, the land, um, we, never, we never depreciate that at all. A lot of, a lot of uh, people who do their own taxes will make this mistake. Either they get so confused with depreciation that they don't take it at all. They say, well, I, I just never took depreciation because you know, I was running uh, you know, kind of uh, cash negative or cash neutral anyway, so I never even wrote off the depreciation. Um, or oftentimes with people doing their own taxes, they'll depreciate everything, um, which of the two scenarios, I guess it's better to, to, to write it uh, right off everything as opposed to nothing. Um, and the reason for that is when you go to sell the property, uh, whether you depreciate it or not, the IRS says, hey, you know, you're going to have to pay the taxes on uh, whether you depreciated it or not on what the depreciation would have been. And so the phrase that they use is allowed, whatever. So whatever they allowed, if you wrote off too much, you know, you've got to pay the taxes on that um, or allowable. What, what you would have been allowed to write off over the years, um, you're still going to have to pay the taxes on that. So uh, whatever you're doing, if, you're, uh, if you've got rental properties, make sure you're depreciating them because uh, usually, you know, that's anywhere from uh, on most properties, it's going to be a seven thousand dollar to you know whatever, it, it, but it, it's you know tens tens hundred thousand dollars a year on a building, um, but even on a small property, it's going to be six seven eight thousand dollars a year uh, of a write off. And whether you take it or not, you're going to have to pay taxes on it later on down the road. At least if everything's done correctly, 
Um, there is a way if you haven't been taking uh, depreciation over the years that uh, we can do a change of accounting method and uh, and take it all at once. Um, so that's that's something that we've done for clients many many times over. Um, and so you know, talk to an accountant. It's uh, it's it's relatively straightforward form. You know, we charge we we only charge like four or five hundred bucks to do it. Um, and you know, oftentimes people are getting. A, uh, a, a refund of tens of thousands of dollars because they haven't been depreciating properly. Okay, so uh, pass through businesses. Uh, and this is that uh, QBID that I was talking about before. Um, and this came under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, so if, uh, if you have, you're, you're allowed to take a 20% deduction on your net income uh, if you have if you have a business um, and so so let's say you have you let's say you have a business and you have a hundred thousand dollar net income you get to take a 20% deduction it means you get to write off you get to take 20 grand off of that and so now your your taxable income becomes eighty thousand uh, dollars this is uh, there, there are some limitations uh, you see up here. If you're single and your uh, taxable income, not your AGI, um, uh, is uh, if you're single and it's over, you know, one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars, or if you're married filing joint and it's over three twenty-nine, there are some limitations. I have a two-page flowchart in my office that I go through when I have to do answer questions on this. Um, actually, it used to be taped right next to my desk here. I don't, I don't know where, but I've got it, and it's it's fairly complicated once you get over these thresholds. Um, but usually, there is some way that we can go ahead and at least get somebody uh, a portion of that. Uh, <clears throat> there's ways to lower your AGI um, uh, as well to bring you down closer to that. Um, but you know, talk to your accountant. Uh, the good news is, you, you know, we. When this first came out, it was so complicated and the rules were just so squirrely that, you know, we, we thought this was going to be really, really tough. And the good news is that when we're preparing returns, most of it's written into the software pretty well. We just have to know, we just have to understand the rules um, to make it sure that it's applied properly. Um, but, you know, if, if you're it, um, now. What's interesting is as a uh, as real estate investor, uh, some some rental businesses now qualify for this, whereas originally uh, the IRS said no, that you could not do this. And so uh, they, they came along and uh, I actually wrote down a note here. Just give me one sec. Where, um, yeah. Yeah. Originally, you couldn't originally you couldn't do it. But the IRS came back and said. Uh, if you manage the property uh, and you put enough hours in and uh, you, you're, you don't have a triple net lease or anything like that, where, you know, it's a property where you, if it's a property where your hands off, you're not going to be able to take advantage of this. But if it's a property where you're managing it and you're, you're paying some of the expenses, whether it's the utilities or uh, property taxes, whatever. Um, so is this not a triple net lease? Then you should be able to take advantage of this. And so, uh, you know, it's it's something you might want to talk to your accountant about. Uh, just make sure that you are taking advantage of Qubit if you're one of those people who has, uh, you know, mul uh, rental property or multiple rental properties and you do a lot of the hard work yourself. Uh, I know you guys, <laughs> you know, here we on the East Coast, we've got a lot of people who are just uh, unbelievably busy, and we don't and don't have a lot of grit and, and pay for management companies. But the further west you go, you guys have a little bit more grit than we do. <laughs> and uh, I've always managed my rental properties, but uh, um, so I'm sure a lot of you folks do too. Uh, let's see here, record keeping when, when you're uh, when. As a real estate investor, you are going to want to keep track of the, the amount of time you spend on uh, your business. Um, it, yeah, it, it helps you, uh, you know, determine what it, it helps you determine how much you're putting into the business and, and whether it's worth it and things like that. But uh, the one of the number one questions we get is, uh, you know, what kind of documents should I keep and and uh, and what do I need in case of an audit? 
look, in, in the case of an audit, they're, they're going to want just about everything. Um, they're going to want bank statements and uh, rental checks and, and things like this. And people always ask me, how long should I keep it? And the answer is, especially with rentals, you really want to keep stuff pretty much forever. That's not to say, let your office get filled with paperwork, get a scanner, scan it in, put it up in the cloud somewhere, you know, I, I mean, you know, go ahead and redact any personal information or, or things like that if you're worried about security, but just scan it all in. And so that you can you, you free up your desk, free up your office. And, uh, and then you've got that peace of mind that if the IRS ever came back and audited something, um, it, with real estate investors, you, you folks have to worry about when you go to sell the property, establishing your basis. Um, hold on. I just heard from Linda. Hold on. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, you, you'll need, in case of an audit, you would, they would oftentimes want you to um, prove what your, what your basis is. And the way to prove that is what you spent on the property, what you spent in improvements on the property, things that you weren't able to write off over the years, uh, things like that. The, uh, those are the types of things the IRS would uh, be looking for. I have seen them audit um, uh, where somebody sold a rental property and we added a lot of stuff to the basis at the very end because she, uh, the, the client had said, well, yeah, I only paid this much for the property, but I did all this work. And I said, well, you didn't tell us over the years. And so we should have been depreciating it. We didn't, you know, it was a, one of those clients who shows up the last week of tax season. And, and so we're not communicating very well, but in the end, we won the audit, you know, they didn't even, uh, they didn't even ding us on the, um, uh, you know, what would have been allowed depreciation on the improvements, which would have been kind of picky on their part, but still. Uh, they could have they could have dinged us on that, and and we won the audit. So usually, if you've got something, uh, if you've got about eighty percent of the what the IRS is needs or wants or is asking for, a lot of times they'll say, okay, you know, we understand the the rest of the stuff. Not everyone's perfect, and um, but if you just go into an audit with absolutely nothing, then you know, uh, it's it, it's not going to be a good situation. There there are there there's still things that an accountant can do as far as, well, you know, this is what the extent, you know, obviously the person had expenses, they were running a business and, you know, uh, and here, and this is what we've got as far as, uh, you know, you've got to give us some reasonable expenses and, and that, that, that can happen. But uh, let's see here. So, um, uh, oh yeah, if you, if you have a property, and you rent, um, if you rent to friends and family, uh, not friends, sorry, if you rent to family members, uh, you're gonna want uh, proof of what the, or if you have a property and you rent it to yourself, you're gonna want to have proof of what the fair market value of the rent would be. Um, and so maybe, you know, comps or things like that. Uh, so that, because if you're renting it to a family member, Technically, if you're, in, you, let's say you're renting to a family member for 75% of what fair market value is, technically you're supposed to actually include in your income 100% of what the fair market value would be. So, uh, you know, go ahead and find the, the crack house up for rent, you know, a couple blocks down and, and find that advertisement and throw it in your records. And, <laughs> and, then, and then maybe you can, uh, you can justify why you're uh, charging your cousin or your, um, you know, your son or, or whatever, uh, a little bit less money. So let's see here, investment property, things you, you folks need to be, and this is, this has been going on forever. You folks need to be aware of, uh, limited rental losses. Uh, for those of you who are not real estate, uh, professionals, uh, then you need to, you need to know that you can only write off if your AGI is between zero and a hundred thousand dollars, you can only write off rental losses to the tune of $25,000 a year. Um, and then you've got a phase out range between, uh, $100,000 and $150,000 if your uh, adjusted gross income is between that range. You know, for every $2,000, you lose $1,000 of that 25K. Um, at at, um, at $150,000 adjusted gross income, you cannot take 
real estate losses un, uh, contemporaneously unless you're a real estate professional. There is good news though. Those losses are held in abeyance until you go and sell that property. And when that property is sold, you uh, your basis is, it's not increased, but it's, it's not been decreased by those losses uh, over the years. So um, if those losses prevent you from paying taxes later on down the road when you go to sell it. So it, it, it'll be nice in that you may be able to avoid having to do a 1031 exchange, a like kind exchange later on down the road because um, you, you weren't able to take the losses along the way anyway. And, and so the tax bill is not that great when you go to uh, sell the property. Uh, let's see here. I'm only halfway through my presentation and, uh, and I'm running low on time here. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, and then if you are a real estate professional, then, uh, your losses, it, just because you're a real estate professional doesn't mean you can always take your losses there. It's based on a number of factors. First of all, you have to be a full-time real estate professional. And so if you're a full-time real estate professional, if you say you're a full-time real estate professional and you have, because you have a real estate license, and then you also work at a bank, you know, as with a W-2 job, well, you better be working, if you're working 40 hours a week at the bank, you better be working 41 hours a week as a real estate professional, which, you know, really doesn't happen. A lot of times people will hold a license and they'll do real estate part-time, but really their primary job is, you know, their 40 hour work uh, job. So um, if you're a real estate professional and, uh, you know, that's your, that's your primary business uh, and you have rental properties, then you have to be managing those rental properties uh, and you've got to put in, you know, 500 uh, hours a year. You've got to be putting in more hours a year than anybody else's into those properties. Um, if you have multiple properties, you can you can group them together in certain cases. Uh, that they, the IRS just started letting people do that back in uh, 2014, I believe. Uh, so it, everyone's situation is different, but uh, a lot of times, for those of you who who have a real estate license, who practice in real estate and you do a lot of work on your rental properties. Uh, and, uh, and then after you factor in depreciation, those rental properties show a loss, then you can, you can write down a huge amount of income uh, by doing everything properly. Uh, you do want to document it. Uh, we saw about six years ago that uh, the IRS was doing tons of audits of real estate professionals who were writing off losses. Uh, and anyone, any of the ones that we, we, we handle about 1600 realtors a year. Uh, and so uh, when I say tons of audits, we were, we were seeing three or four a year, which is a lot of audits for, for us. Um, we don't, we don't see many audits, but we, we've got, you know, the people on board who can handle it for our clients. We don't handle, uh, non-client audits anymore, thankfully, um, but, uh, but we were seeing quite a few audits on this very issue of real estate professionals writing off. Uh, and, and we were able to win in every single case, but it is something that they're aware of. And it's, it's one of those issues that it's, it's low enough level that it's easy for them to audit. Uh, and so they, they do like to audit this issue because they can, make, uh, they, can, they can bring in a lot of money and they don't need an auditor who is a very high level accountant to just say, no, we can't, you can't take those losses. So um, you want to make sure that you're working once again with a, uh, with a tax accountant who's well-versed in real estate. Uh, I believe Linda's on if somebody wants to uh, uh, let her, um, uh, she said she's on if, uh, if somebody can find her and. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Hey. Fantastic. Well, I have I have done half of the speech, and uh, and luckily we are on. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you do. Uh, oh, you know what? I've only got one more slide, and then the rest were yours anyway. So this is almost perfect timing. I only ended up doing a couple of your slides. So sorry, sorry everybody for the the. It's not the fault of Dubai. It's Linda Marler's fault. Anyway, hello, and I'm going to help you try to help you as much as my wonderful son Preston. Okay, I get to work on flipping. Yep, um, yep. I'm, I'm assuming that there's some people in this wonderful audience who buy properties and then sell them from time to time. 
Um, the IRS doesn't mind that. They're happy to do it. There's two different ways of treating them. Uh, Schedule D, that's just the form that it goes on if you buy and sell something immediately and you haven't really rented it out or used it for business use. You just buy it and usually fix it up and sell it for a much higher price, we're hoping at least. Or Schedule C means you use it as a business which means you have an inventory. Maybe you buy several houses, uh, especially if you do more than three in one year where you've bought them and sold them all in one year, or you may have held them for many years, but you've actually just bought them and sold them and you never really rented them out. And if you do more than three in one year, you're considered a business, which means it goes as a regular business, which means you have to pay social security tax on it and you don't get the lower tax rate on the um the actual sale. Now, if you rent it and hold it out with intent to rent, then of course you do get the actual good capital gain rate. Otherwise, if you're going to sell them short term and you use it as a business, you do have the advantage by doing that, that you can take it as social security income, which increases your social security credits, although you may not really interested in that. That's not so important. But what is important is it means you can set up a retirement plan and you can deduct all of your extraneous expenses, such as your office in your home and things like that. Okay, I don't want in control of the slide. So Preston, would you give us the next one, sweetie? Oh, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. <clears throat> I teach a continuing education here class. Uh, it's 90 minutes long for the uh, real estate associations here and also some several real estate schools on tax-free exchanges. And Preston's probably already explained to you that this was one of the items that they thought they would do away with um, under the new tax law of 2017. However, the real estate lobby, bless their hearts, and thank you, God, they were able to fight it. So <clears throat> tax-free exchanges are no longer allowed for personal property, such as cars, uh, if you have tractors or um anything that you use that's personal property. But if it's real estate, thank goodness they are still allowed. Um, I'm a real estate broker myself. I'm not in competition with any realtors. I don't do any real estate. I refer out any business that I have to a real realtor who does it constantly. But <clears throat> this is how I started Tax Masters. Back many years ago when I did real estate, I only did commercial and industrial real estate which I think is much easier than doing anything to do with residential. But um, I was very lucky. I sold a building to somebody who was doing a tax deferred exchange, and then they had to buy three other buildings to make up for the difference, which I'm going to explain to you. And then I made four commissions. I made the, the buy and sell commission on four different properties. And you know what I did? I said, wow, real estate is really hard. I'm going to do something that's really easy and fun. I'm going to do taxes. And that's when I founded Tax Masters <clears throat> many years ago, actually before even Preston was born. So thanks to tax-free exchanges, Tax Masters was not only born, but also you folks can make a ton of money or even just save a ton of money. First of all, <clears throat> be aware, there's six different names. You can call it anything you want. I like to prefer, I prefer to call it tax deferred exchange because at the time it happens, it really is a deferral. Now, what does that mean? It means that as long as you sell your property and you replace it with a new property or properties that costs as much as the selling price, the net selling price of your old investment property, <clears throat> then you don't have to pay any tax on the gain. You can call it a Starker. That's just the name of the tax law that, that, that really uh, it codified the law. It's called Section 1031. If you ever have any trouble sleeping at night, I just suggest you pull out Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Service Code. You'll be out like a light, I promise. <laughs> I can see John laughing. Now, they can also call it like kind exchange or like purpose, but I do not like those names, not Linda's favorite. Why? Because it doesn't have to be like kind. Let's say that John owns a little property or uh, it could be a condo, it could be a building, it could be residential, commercial, whatever it is. 
if he decides he wants to sell it, but he doesn't need the money because he's very wealthy, what John will do is exchange it for a new property. Now, it doesn't have to be a direct exchange. In other words, he's selling Mr. Smith his property, but <clears throat> Mr. Smith doesn't have to buy Mr. Lee's property. Mr. Smith just has to sell it. So all it has to do is be real estate for real estate. In other words, you could have a condo and sell it for a horse farm. You could have a horse farm and sell it for a casino, as long as it has real estate underneath of it. You could have a casino and sell it for an apartment complex. Or you could have just a little single family dwelling and sell it for a little gas station or anything that's real estate. It has to be real estate. So I do not like the name like kind or like purpose. At least my, it's not my favorite. And it's only now allowed for real estate. And as long as you do these exchanges, first of all, you need a good realtor to help you, of course. Also, you must have a good accountant. Uh, you're going to have to fill out a form 8824 in order to conduct the exchange for your tax purposes. And the 8824 is very complicated. You better not try to do it yourself. And for heaven's sakes, don't try to do it on turbo trash. Um, we pay we pay over forty thousand dollars every year for the tax program that we use to do taxes for our clients. So if you think that a turbo trash at one hundred dollars can handle something like this, or even handle a self employed person, you're wrong. It's not going to do it for you. So tax free exchanges, you exchange your property, you get a new property or properties. It can be several. And as long as you do this within a 180 day period, and as long as you identify in writing the address or addresses of the new properties within 45 days of actually selling the old property, then all of this can be handled and you defer the taxes. And what I've had is many times <clears throat> clients will buy properties, trade them and keep trading them. And as long as you keep doing this until you go off to your little cloud and then your very lucky children like mine or your very lucky beneficiaries will inherit the properties at what is now the law, which is a stepped up basis. Nobody ever pays any tax on any of the gains. This is one of the most overlooked tax laws for uh, real estate investors. And sometimes it's not that they overlook it, but they don't follow the rules. This is why you need, what did I tell you? What do you need? You remember? You need a realtor. Okay. You need a good accountant and um, a little patience also. And of course, you're going to have to hire a qualified intermediate to help you. Okay. The next slide, please. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, Preston, I'll let you handle this one really Sure, quick. sure, no problem. <laughs> or entities, we've got, we've got multiple different entities that that, uh, that you can go ahead and get yourself into. Um, first is a, a sole proprietor. You haven't registered or anything. You're just conducting business on your own. Uh, and so that is uh, that goes on your personal tax return on a Schedule C. Uh, the next step up from that would be a single member LLC, where you're doing much the same you were as a sole proprietor, but you've, uh, you've registered the business uh, oftentimes with your state, and then uh, and you've gotten an EIN number from the IRS. And a single member LLC does not give you any tax benefit. It is strictly there as legal protection for your uh, for your business. So if something goes awry in your business and you get sued, at least you know they can't take away your house. This is this is the legal theory behind it. I'm not an attorney. I did go to law school, but I'm not an attorney. Uh, and uh, but but that's why you open a, a single member LLC. Uh, I have I have a couple rental properties myself. So I know what you guys go through and I put each one in its own LLC. So if something goes wrong with that, then, uh, then you know, it doesn't carry over and, and take my other rental properties. Uh, so uh, sole member LLC, you do it strictly for the legal protection. A lot of times clients tell me, hey, I opened up an LLC and I say, well, what kind of LLC? You know, um, I, I don't know. It, oftentimes, it 100% of the time, it's the wrong one, just about uh, because they didn't talk to me first. But uh, LLC doesn't mean anything but limited liability company. It can be a sole member LLC. It can be a C Corp. It could be an S Corp. 
um, and a multi-member LLC is part is called partnership. Uh, and so, uh, when when people say LLC, it's it's too generic a term to really mean anything. Uh, so they they think they're being specific, but they're not. Um, it, Another uh, entity that got uh, that started to get a little popular with the drop in the corporate tax rates a few years ago was the C Corp. But with, once you factor in uh, double taxation, it, it was it was really hard to make a C Corp work. Um, and I can't even remember the term, but a lot of professional businesses get tax don't even get to take advantage of. Uh, C corp rates, accountants. We can't take advantage of C corp rates, uh, as well as doctors, lawyers. Uh, so you know the the type of people who would want to be oftentimes taking advantage of the lower uh, income tax rates for businesses. You can't even do it anyway. Um, but then once you factor in the double taxation, which is the corporation is getting taxed, and then when you distribute. Uh, profits to the individual, then the individual gets taxed. Um, so the C corp is not a pass through entity. So uh, we have, you know, you know, we have thousands of clients, and I think we do five C corps a year. We very, very few. Um, uh, so it, it really doesn't make sense for for uh, most people. The S corp now for individuals who. It, or you know, if you've got a business and and you're you're netting over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, um, and that's you know, I'm going off of uh, this area because you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary, and in this area that that salary is going to be you know, it's definitely going to be six figures. Um, I, I try and keep it as close to six figures as possible, not go too much above or, or below. But uh, with an S corp, you've got to pay yourself a reasonable salary. And so, uh, and you know, the accounting gets much more expensive and uh, and much more complicated. But if you net in your business over two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year consistently, uh, uh, or you know, it, it, let's say it's inconsistent and you have million dollar years and then uh, thirty thousand dollar years, still going to be worth it to uh, go ahead and open an S corp. But if you're if you're if you're making a hundred grand and your accountant starts pushing you towards an S corp, um, I'm not going to say run for the door, but uh, it's really uh, it's it's a cart before the horse situation because a lot of people get themselves uh, you know open themselves an S corp and then get themselves in a lot more tax trouble than they bargained for uh, because they're just not they're not keeping it in compliance. Uh, they have to file two tax returns a year. They don't. They didn't realize that you know you've got to have good bookkeeping. You've got to be doing your uh, your your uh, quarterly meetings, things like that. Um, so uh, yeah, and then there's partnerships. The the only sale, the only ships that don't float are partnerships. Uh, you know, try and stay away from partnerships unless it's uh, it's your your wife. You know who who you know you've been together for a decade and and you you guys are going to be together for the rest of your life or something. Fine, you can do a partnership together. But um, yeah, very few. Uh, we don't have a ton of. We do a lot of partnerships. We do have a lot of client uh, partnership clients, but oftentimes they don't uh, they don't end well after uh, you know five or six years or so. Uh, but your accountant should really, uh, you know, before you talk to your attorney, your accountant should be the one telling you which entity you need to be. And if you're making, uh, if you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars net, you know, not not gross, but if you're netting one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and your your accountant's telling you, look, I think you should be a sole member LLC, and you should, yes, there could be some savings by switching you to an S corp, but it's going to be more complicated. That's great advice. That's really, really good advice. And, you know, it's much, uh, you know, your life's going to be much more simple as the longer you can stay a sole member LLC. Once you become an S corp, you know, if, if you're our client, get ready to pay uh, around 10 grand a year to keep that S corp in compliance between our tax accounting fees, uh, bookkeeping fees, uh, and payroll fees. And it's it, to run an S corp properly it is going to be eight to 10 grand, uh, minimum in, in this area. Um, and you know what, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, uh, the accountants who train us here, 
uh, come from the same region in the country of you as you folks. So, you know, I, I know their prices aren't any cheaper than ours. <laughs> so I, I, I am mentioning, you know, what it costs to run and do things here, but I, I and I, I understand that, you know, things might be a little bit less expensive where you are, but uh, I know the accountants aren't, aren't much, much less expensive than, than here. Uh, okay, Linda, you are up. I am up. Yes, and let me mention just one thing um, about partnerships, corporations, and all those things. You don't know how many times, as Preston said, clients will come into our office. Oh, I went to this seminar, and the lawyer said that I need to do all of these things. And of course, what the lawyer said was very good for the lawyer, but really not good for the client. So talk to your accountant, hopefully an accountant that knows about real estate. And by the way, don't ever put your home in an LLC. Um, this is a true story. I had a client, a lady, she's a widow. She went to one of these estate planning seminars and things. And she came back to me and said, oh, I got this done. And they put my house in an LLC. You know what I did? I said, I want that lawyer's name right now. I called him up and I said, I'm going to take your license. You are an idiot. Do you know that by putting my client's house into an LLC, she has now lost the ability to take the $250,000 exclusion on her home when she sells it. And, um, she, she, and of course, if you sell within 500, within the couple of years of her husband dying, she would have had a 500,000 exclusion. So um, he said, really? He said, I never knew that. I said, of course you don't know that because you don't study taxes like we do. So don't ever put your home in an LLC. I'll, mm -hmm. Okay, now I get to talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world. Oh, no. before before you go on, the worst the the worst tax returns I've ever seen were prepared by attorneys. Oh my <laughs> gosh, yes, yes. <laughs> I, individuals usually take more care to study the law and figure things out than attorneys do. Um, I, I I do know a couple of attorneys who are also accountants, who, but the worst tax returns that I've ever seen come across my desk have been prepared by attorneys. Yes, I think that one of the first employees I ever had to hire was a nice gentleman. He had a law degree and he had a, a master in taxation from Georgetown University. And I think he was with us about six months, was he, Preston? <laughs> Awful, terrible. Oh, my goodness. So watch out for attorneys that want to do your tax returns or attorneys that want to put your house into an LLC. Now, yeah, a, 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 attorneys want to rack up billable hours. Accountants want to get the job done and move on to their next client. <laughs> yes. And we're allowed to say that. Um, uh, when Preston was talking about partnerships, I had to laugh because I've been divorced five times and I'm not so big on partnerships either. I agree with him on that. But part, Pre Preston does have a sister who's an attorney and she knows better than to try and, and assist people with taxes. She studied a lot of tax courses when she was in uh, law school, which attorneys don't have to even take tax courses. It's voluntary, as you know. Okay, let me talk about retirement planning because this is one of my most favorite subjects. And there's three, there's three of the most overlooked tax deductions in the whole tax code for self-employed people. Um, well, actually anybody from the, in the United States. The first one is of course, claiming office and home, which we didn't cover here today, but we'd be happy to in the future. Number one is office and home. If you don't have an office in your home and you are self-employed, shame on you, you're stupid because I helped get that law changed in 1999. The second thing is a medical reimbursement plan, which we're also not covering today, but a medical reimbursement plan, if you are self-employed, allows you to deduct all of your medical bills as a business expense, okay? How would you like to do that? It's wonderful, okay? It only works really well if you're self-employed. The third thing is what's called a solo 401k, which I'm gonna explain now, which was invented 20 years ago. It's not a new tax law. And it allows you to borrow money from your retirement account to buy real estate or to buy anything you want actually. But um, we're not talking about self-directed IRA. No, absolutely not. Those aren't even qualified plans. We're gonna, I'll explain to you why those are bad. But let's go back to what happened 20 years ago. 20 years ago, Congress was appalled to find out, whoops, can you go back one? I think, what's number 14, honey? Yes, 
the Congress was appalled to find out that 95% of every retired American in the United States, and this is still true today, 95% of every person in this wonderful, powerful country in which we live, and I love this country, especially, well, I can't say this country, I love Dubai also, but I love our country. I was born on the 4th of July, so I'm very patriotic. But anyway, it's a, a crime and a shame that that means that 95% of every person who's retired cannot survive on a month to month basis without the help of a check from welfare, their church, their children, or social security. So you don't wanna be one of the 95%. You wanna be one of the what? The 5% who don't need to survive. John, you don't wanna count on your little grandson to support you when you retire, do you? Or you certainly don't wanna require your children or social security or welfare or anything else or your church. But here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do what I tell you to. Now, of course, those of you who are employed, if you're, in, oops, hang on, I got to plug in my, my thingy here. Those of you who are employed, you need to have, you need to have a 401k where you work or some kind of employment where you work. However, if you're self-employed, who's your boss? Who's going to provide for your employment? You are. And this is how you're going to do it. Thanks to Congress passing this law 20 years ago. Okay, next slide now. Thank you, honey. <clears throat> Up until 20 years ago, you weren't available, you weren't allowed to have a solo 401k. The only thing available to you were the updated, and of course, they are both unqualified, a SEP or an IRA. That was it. That's all you could have. Now, 20 years ago, Congress said, we need to encourage self-employed people to provide for their futures. How can we do this? We're going to make it really easy for them to have a qualified plan, not unqualified, qualified, which sounds better. Would you rather go to a qualified dentist or an unqualified dentist? I think you're going to choose the qualified dentist. You don't want anybody drilling on your teeth who hasn't been to dental school. So a solo 401k, and don't tell me you can't afford it. The ones that we use, we don't sell them, but the ones that we use for our clients, <clears throat> they cost $160 a year and the cost is fully deductible, okay? Plus anything you put into it is fully deductible. Okay, now the next slide. Thank you. The qualified is better. First of all, it's qualified. That sounds better, right? But it's better, for, in my opinion, for four reasons. The first reason is that every dollar that you put into your plan is 100% protected from lawsuits, creditors, and bankruptcy. I'm going to repeat that. Only a qualified plan, not a SEP, not an IRA, only the qualified S solo 401k is 100% protected from lawsuits, creditors, and bankruptcy. Only the solo 401k will allow you to borrow from the plan for any reason whatsoever. Any reason. You're allowed to borrow the money out for five years, any reason. Now, if you're taking the money out to buy your own home, actually your primary residence where you're going to sleep, then you have a 15-year payback period. Number three reason, you have until October 15th of the following year to make your contribution. So um, I always make mine by October 1st because I figure that's, that's good enough. So you have all summer to save up your money to put into your plan. Another reason is you can put in a whole bunch of income. They just raised it now this year to $19,500 plus 20% of your net earned income. Let me give you an example. Let's say that John comes to see us to get his taxes done. And he had a really slow year. He only made $180,000 being self-employed or flipping houses or whatever he wants to do. So he comes to see us. Let's see who we choose. Or maybe Jay in our office. You would like Jay. He's very talented. He passed all his exams the first time. And he's very good at deductions. So Jay does John's return. And he comes up with $80,000 worth of business deductions. All right. So what does that mean? Well, John had 180, less 80 in business deductions. So now he's got to pay taxes on $100,000. John, do you want to pay taxes on $100,000? No. So he says, Jay, do something, fix it. 
make it go away, hide it. So Jay says, well, we're going to open up a, we'll have you open up a solo 401k. You're allowed to put in now this year $19,500. Plus you're also allowed to put in 20% of your net earned income. How much is that? Well, 20% of the net in income of 100,000, that's 20,000. So now he's up to 39,500. Now, John's not over 50. He can't be, no, such a handsome. You look just like my husband, actually. Anyway, uh, so he's allowed to put in an extra $6,500. So now he's up to over almost half of what he made he can put into his solo 401k. It's deductible right off the front page of his tax return, brings his adjusted gross income down, and he has access to the money the next day if he needs it for any reason. Now, he can only take out $50,000 at, at one time. That's the, the total amount. But it allows you to put more money into it, depending on how much you made. It's qualified. It's protected. You can borrow from it. You can put the money in up till October 15th. What is there not to love about a solo 401k? Any of you who have an IRA or a SEP and you're self-employed, that you must be, you have to be self-employed to do this. If you have an IRA or SEP, you have an idiot for a tax accountant because this law changed 20 years ago. It went into effect in 2001. You also have, even probably worse, a real idiot for an investment advisor because all your money is not in a qualified account. They've been leaving your money in a separate IRA. Why? Because they don't want to lose your money. They want to keep it. So you need to take your money away, fire all those people and put it somewhere where it's safe, like I do. Now, next slide. Let's say this is just an example if you take out 10,000, you could take out 50,000. But <clears throat> let's say that John is thinking of buying a property and he's looking at it and the down payment for the property is this much money, whatever it is, X. <clears throat> and the realtor says, this is how much, John, you have to bring this much money with you to the settlement. And uh-oh, John looks in his checking account. He's only got $40,000 in his checking account. So he says, well, no problem. I'll just walk into my friendly bank where I have my unqualified <laughs> IRA or my unqualified SEP. And he withdraws $10,000 from his IRA. What happens? he immediately has to pay federal tax. I know he's at least in the 24, 24 25% bracket. So 25% of 10,000, there it's on the screen. 2,500 tax, gone, he'll never see it again. He also has to pay state tax. State taxes run between six and 8%. In our area where we live, it's, it's always 8%. So 8% of 10,000, that's 800, gone, never see it again. Oh, John is under 59 and a half. He has to pay a 10% penalty. What does that mean? Oh, $10,000 times 10% is 1000 Gone. Never see it again. So they hand him a check for $4,300 less than the money he actually needs of 10000 So he walks out of the bank with a check for $5,700. He can't buy the property. John, this is very bad, isn't it? No, 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 no. Thank goodness John knows about Linda and tax masters. And of course, we would send him to our investment advisor, Mark Moninger. He's the certified financial planner that we use. Or you can use anybody for your solo 401k. Just don't pay more than 160 and make sure it has the loan feature. So now he borrows from his 401k the 10,000 he needs. He's got the whole 10,000. There's no federal, no state tax, no penalty. For as long as he has the loan, he needs to make interest only payments on it, but that's only 5% per year. It's been the same amount for 20 years, but he's paying the interest to himself. So his 401k continues to grow, okay? And he's got the whole 10,000 to buy the property. I'll give you an example. When Preston's sister, Gia, she's my daughter, who's an attorney also, she went to law school up in Baltimore. Um, I didn't want to pay rent for three years to, for her to live 50 miles away from her home. So I took $35,000 out of my what? Out of my solo 401k, because it was sitting in there. And I bought a little townhouse up in Baltimore for 135000 It was very nice in a good neighborhood, safe, everything. Okay. 
Okay, she's in law school for three years. She passed the bar the first time. She comes home to mommy. I sold the townhouse. Guess what? I sold it three and a half years later for $210,000. How much did I pay? 135, sold it for 210. I made enough money to pay for all of her law school just by owning a property. When Preston was in school at the University of Maryland, yay, go Terps. He, um, I bought him a house or we bought a house together uh, for 165,000 on Wellesley Drive. I still remember it. And I told him, Preston, as long as you rent out the other bedrooms for enough money to cover the, uh, the uh, mortgage payment and the expenses, you can keep all the profits. Oh my gosh, he rented out the closets. He, <laughs> he was boarding, didn't you? had some cats that belonged to some of the girls in the dorm and of course there were things. He, he did a really good job of renting the property. And we sold it about six years later for a $100,000 profit. So if you have kids going to college, and you want to make money, buy them something to live in, put them in charge of renting it out, and you'll make, a, hopefully you'll make a profit. If you have a good realtor, I always use a good realtor. Okay, um, I think we go to the next slide, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yay. If you have a, if you're a prospective client or have a question, there's our website, you go on there, fill out the form. If you're thinking about a medical reimbursement plan so that you can deduct all of your medical bills as a business expense. By the way, business expenses save you four taxes. Preston probably covered that. They save you federal tax and state tax, social security, and Medicare. Whereas personal deductions, uh, they only save you federal and state tax. So if you have a choice, you want a business deductions. If you have any questions about a 401k, then give Mark a call. I've been using him for 20 years. He's the best. He's the best retirement advisor I've ever found, and I love him, and I don't get any kickback on anything, neither tax masters. Okay, open it up. Can, how can we help you? You're still smiling, John. Thank you. <laughs> oh, John's on, John, John's on, um, on, on silent. Okay. Our health, yes, yes, <clears throat> but they're only deductible if you have a if you have a medical reimbursement plan, it costs about $800 to set it up. Here's what happens. Normally, you're a normal citizen. You work for the government or you work for a company. You have medical bills. You may have a little flexible spending account, $2,500. That's nothing. But what happens is you can only deduct the bills that exceed 7.5% of your income. So let's say we have a husband makes $50,000 and the wife makes $50,000 joint tax return. $100,000, 7.5% is $7,500. So that means that the first $7,500 that they pay for health insurance or any medical bills of any kind is not deductible. They can only deduct what exceeds $7,500. So if they have $8,000 worth of medical bills, they can only deduct $500. No, no, that's really bad. But if you're self-employed and you have a medical reimbursement plan, in other words, you're going to hire yourself as your own employee. Better yet, if you're married, you can hire your spouse as your employee. I told you I've been married six times. During those times, I've hired my spouses to sort of help me with my work, just part-time, a little bit. Then, And your spouse, of course, can have other jobs. I have one client, her spouse is a, is a director of the World Bank in Washington, makes hundreds of thousands, and she's a little part-time realtor, but she hires her husband and he helps her and he delivers things and sometimes and he answers the phone and he also um, puts out signs or goes out with her at night, things like that to uh, keep her safe. So as long as you have an employee, whether it's yourself or your spouse, then you're allowed to have a medical reimbursement plan. Then as a business expense on your Schedule C, as we call it, or on your corporate tax return, you deduct all of your medical bills as a business expense. So now 100% of your bills are deductible. They save you federal, state, social security, and Medicare taxes. So if you have a choice of saving just two taxes on $500 or four taxes on every dollar, which is better? Linda's always right. If you don't believe me, I can tell you to ask my five ex-husbands. By the way, I still do their taxes, <laughs> the ones that are alive anyway. <laughs> that was a very good question. Now, 
Any more questions? I love questions. Preston and I love questions. We have one here on the, in the auditorium. Hold on. Okay. Uh, question. Your thoughts on um, subdirector raw IRAs? No! 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 You, you are forbidden. You are forbidden. Now, if you have... If you have a solo 401k, and if you've already contributed the maximum allowable to the 401k, I will let you do a Roth on top of that. No, no, you reduce this year's taxes immediately. This is what I do on my personal tax return, and I will do the same for you. Any do oh, first of all, most Roths that you, I bet you've never even heard of a Roth 401k. I bet you never heard of it. Okay, th they're sold by the banks and the companies that want to sell them to you. They don't know the tax consequences. Yes, I know someday when you take the money out, the money's not taxable and all that stuff. No, 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 no. Save the money today, use that money today to buy real estate. Uh, Preston has two sisters. Um, and the other sister, she's a realtor. She owns the real estate company. Uh, afterwards with the, uh, with, with the Stop summer. worrying about taxes 20 years from now. It could be that, that you'll go to your little cloud and your children will inherit the money. No. Are you t uh, now, you can talk to Mark and Mark doesn't, he get, he's not vehement about it like I am. But if, if, if you, want my, you want my opinion and 40 years of experience with taxes, Save the dollars today, and you you can still have the Roth, but do what I'm telling you to do first. Hey, I got a question for you. Yeah, anybody else here? I got one. Go ahead. Um, the slide for the pass through where he said there was three hundred twenty nine thousand eight hundred dollars for a married filing joint. Is yes. that a gross or an AGI? That's a that's an AGI figure. Actually, I think it's taxable income, but they, they're going to be. Uh, is that taxable? I, I heard it is taxable on the slide, but I think it's an AGI figure. Linda, do you, do you remember? But regardless, it's not gross. It's not gross. That's good then. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Question from the crowd. Wait. Yeah, I have a question. I'm actually a, a real estate professional, and uh, I'm interested in getting into buying syndications as a limited partner. So am I able to, obviously with syndications you're familiar with, they do cost segregations, they spin off huge losses. So will I be able to go ahead and take those losses with the, you know, again, I have some gains with mine, will I be able to write off my losses? Obviously, my wife also has a business that, that spins off huge amount of income. So I'll be able to deduct the, the losses from her, and, you know, all the losses of, of uh, the business. I'm just kind of curious on, on on some of the rules. Yeah, you're you're going to have to watch out for you know to make sure that you have enough basis uh, on the losses, um, and uh, and it, it can offset other passive uh, other uh, passive income or other passive. Uh, losses, they can knock each other out. As far as offsetting your wife's income, most likely not. Uh, I, right, Linda, you would agree with me on that? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, it, like oh, he, he said he's a real estate professional. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's a real estate professional for that but, reason. Preston, uh, by the way, Preston's father was a world expert on, he's passed away. He was my third ex-husband, very good one, um, and very smart. He was a world expert on the uh, uh, syndications and things like that. But you need to have a really good tax accountant to help you because a lot of times the limited, the, the limited live, lim, excuse me, the limited partnerships throw off losses, which are, they're considered passive by the, that's the IRS calls them passive losses. And they're very hard to deduct unless you have passive gains. Okay. There, may, may I ask a question? Uh, you were talking about the uh, loss held for future gains. How do you collect these losses held? Do you go back, if you've owned a property 12 years, you go back over the 12 years and see which years you lost money in? 
So those, those losses, you weren't able to write them off in the year because, because of your income in, in this case. And so when you go to sell the property, uh, the, 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 it, there's a, a place where you can make an adjustment to the basis and you will gap up the, uh, the basis mm -hmm. on the property so that you don't pay the taxes on it. Uh, the, the accountant should be pretty, uh, it, it's fairly, it's fairly simple. So as, uh, the, uh, unallowed losses have been tracked over the years. Okay. Is that also true if you didn't plan on holding the property very long and you didn't do depreciation the first few years, can you take that depreciation in advance? So that depreciation that you didn't take, uh, you, you're, you're going to, you're going to lose that, okay. um, it, correct. But, uh, but you're only, you know, you go ahead and segregate it, segregate it out so that you're taking as little depreciation as proper as, as possible. You know, you, you make sure that that land value is as high as you. Right. Uh, no, no, we did it. We did it in remaining years when it was obvious. I was going to hold it long, hold it longer than I anticipated. But um, OK, so if that is there a section or a code that you can refer to in the IRS that for well, this, it, uh, it, it's it, it, it's sure. what you're doing is a section 1250 recapture, whereas uh, whereas you're you're writing off the I, I mean sorry you're recapturing and you're paying uh, usually a 25 percent tax on anything that you were able to write off or you would have been allowed to write off. Okay, and that applies to pass through LLCs or individual ownership or anything. Yeah, I, I, I uh, passed. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yep. And I appreciate yep. your kind functions of uh, comments about your certified financial planner. We couldn't <laughs> buy that kind of policy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, be careful about doing your own returns. We had a doctor from NIH. He's just down the street from our mm -hmm. office. It's the National Institutes of Health. And he'd been doing his own tax return because he owned a rental property. And oh. he'd owned it for 10 years and hadn't claimed any depreciation because he said he didn't want to have to worry about what happens when you sell the property. But oh my gosh, what a mess. We had to go back and figure out how much the depreciation would have been. Yeah. And, uh, we did a form 3115, which allowed him then to claim all of the depreciation he had suspended losses because of course he made over $150,000. Mm -hmm. And by the time he sold the property and we figured out his suspended losses, he hardly had any tax on the gain. Whereas he had done his tax return on turbo trash mm -hmm. and he thought he owned about $100,000 tax on the gain and it ended up being about 5,000. So he was very happy. Oh, that <laughs> <laughs> he had heard me on a radio or a TV show or something, but oh my God, please, the, you know, depreciation is, I love talking about right. it and it's, it's really important that it's done properly. And even if you don't get to claim it, it's held in suspension and we're mm -hmm. going to bring it forward and take advantage of it when you sell the property. So you basically, if I hadn't declared any depreciation, I could have brought it forward at the end if I had not depreciated in any of the years. Yes, you have to. You no, you're to <laughs> okay, but I did depreciate, you know, nine or ten years and didn't do the first two because I okay. Okay, it's so not, it, it's not it's not huge, but yeah, the depreciation you would have been able to take. Now, had you taken that depreciation and then the loss was held in advance, there you go. You know, it, it, it gets added to your basis later on down the road. Okay. Yeah, I was told, I said, let's go back and do it. And I was told by the CPA lawyer at the time who right. had an accounting firm uh, that, you know, you can only go back three years. Apparently, yeah. that's, oh, I told you. Apparently yeah. that's not true. That, that's for an amendment. So, so yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I don't like to, I don't like to talk poorly about other accountants okay. or lawyers. Okay. He's since retired. Yeah. 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 And, and so it, what he should have done was a, a change in accounting method. And, okay. uh, and, and but it is what it is. You, you yeah. know, it's not, it's not going to be it's not going to be outrageous. It only happened for two years. You know, it, it had, had you held the property for 20 years, that, that that'd be a different, you know, and not been writing off depreciation. That would have been the problem. No, no, I, I, had, I, uh, I started and sold it this year. Thank heavens. <laughs> so, anyway, you've been most helpful, really. Thank you so much. No problem. Preston, you yes, sir. You mentioned that the adjustable gross income between zero and hundred thousand dollars, you have the capability of uh, having losses at twenty five thousand dollars 
is that on a single tax return, regardless of whether you're married or not? Uh, yes, yes. And so whether or not you're married, exactly. The, the limit is between, it's 100,000 for the full 25K, uh, and then it phases out between 100 and 150K. And if you're married filing separately, you get zero. You're not even a prorated amount. So yep. if you're married filing a separate return because you don't get along with your spouse or you're in the middle of a divorce or something, then no losses are allowed no matter what. Thank you. No problem. It, it, to, to that point, if, uh, if people are married, it, a lot of times when people get married, they say, oh, they come to us and say, should we file separately? And, and I say, you know, if one of the spouses is in a business and they're super shady, then uh, A, we won't take them as a client. But B, yes, then in that case, absolutely, you should you should file separately. But outside of that, you know, if one of the if one of the if neither spouse is shady or running a, a business where they're hiding money or something like that, you should always file. You should always file together. It, not always, but ninety eight point nine percent of the time, it's going to be more advantageous to file together. Hey, I got one more question for you. Sure. Um, from an accountant's perspective, if I have a revocable living trust, how thoroughly do you look at the things that are going to be distributed having been owned by the trust or if they were still in my name, just I was told they were in the trust, but they were still in my personal name? No, wrong. Absolutely incorrect. The name on the title of my home is revocable living trust the name on the title of my retirement account or the beneficiary is my living trust the name on all of my little savings accounts or investment accounts all with mark by the way is with revocable living trust if it's in your name it's not in the trust whoever told yes. you that fire them and get somebody who knows what they're doing i'm in the hmm? process of actually firing them but <laughs> my my question was you because they always say ask ask the accountant and I said we're going to have accountants oh, tonight. This will be right. Right. No, 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 so, no. Then you've got the wrong person. If you don't believe me, you can talk to Gary Altman. And no, or, no, I or, totally believe. We have a guy who teaches trust in the real estate group here, and that's exactly what he said. And this guy that I bought this from said, "Oh no, we don't have to do it. We're going to do it in Nevada." And oh, good lord, oh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have clients come in and they've set up companies in, in you know, in, in different states, Delaware. They think that they're not going to pay taxes. I'm like, no, 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 no. no you're going to end yeah. up paying the lawyer lots of money yeah. for doing it. Yeah. It, 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 I mean, if you if you folks could find, uh, a, you know, between between everybody in this room, somebody has got to have a good accountant in here. And I, I think that. You guys should also have a local accountant come in and talk to y'all because I know right before somebody was looking for an accountant and it'd be really good to have, uh, you know, you, you all need really good tax help as real estate investors. Yes, um, I have one of those. Good, good. I don't consider an attorney. <laughs> Thank you. You're yep. a real estate investor and you're not a W-2 employee. Many times... It's hard to get a loan if you want to buy other property. Mm -hmm. So is it good to go ahead and have an LLC and have a K-2 as income and be an employee of the LLC or should it be a corporation? You can do that. Remember, I said LLC doesn't mean anything. So in this case, what you're referring to is having is, is setting up an S Corp, which is going to be, you know, it's going to be very expensive to run. Uh, having a sole member as, as a sole member LLC. Uh, you can pay yourself a salary um, and you pay yourself a W-2, but it's not technically correct, uh, you know, and, and basically you can get away with doing it for one year. Uh, it, as a self-employed individual, most banks, uh, keep in mind, you know, we've got over 2,000 clients and they're all self-employed. And so if you can show multiple years of steady, of steady income or relatively steady income, uh, the, the banks understand that these days. And, uh, and if, if the bank, you know, I, if you're trying to get a loan with a bank, uh, I know it's harder when you're going to go for a rental property, but if you're, if you're trying to get a loan 
for your own property, uh, your own personal residence or whatever, uh, talk to the bank first and say, look, do you, do you deal with self-employed individuals? And, and you know, is this going to be out of whack for you guys to, you know, have you guys ever seen a Schedule C in your life? And, and if the answer is, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we, we do self-employed individuals all the time. We we'll take a look at the Schedule C. And, and, and then usually they'll ask your accountant to confirm that you've been self-employed for multiple years and and whatever, and uh, and it it should be fairly, you know, it should be fairly straightforward. They get a copy of, you know, multiple years tax returns. Uh, your accountant says yes, individual's been self-employed for X amount of years, and then they check off their box, and and that's it. You know, your 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 loans on to the next step. So, uh, you know, any loan officer who can't uh, underwrite loans for self-employed individuals these days, uh, you know, is you find another, find a different loan officer. Uh, I actually had a lady who makes over a million dollars a year and uh, I'm trying to, oh yeah. So her, her company, she makes over a million dollars a year uh, and was on W-2 for up until the last two years and, uh, and had a loan officer and, and still was making a million a year Okay, is going for a, a loan on a home that's like $1.2 million. So something that somebody of her means can easily afford. She calls me up and says, they won't, they won't, this bank won't underwrite a loan for me um, because I, I don't, I, I don't have two years worth of tax returns. We were just finishing up her second year worth of tax returns. She was working for the same company for the last 20 years, making over a million dollars a year. And I said, the problem is not that you have two years of self-employed income and we haven't filed that, that tax return yet, which we're about to file next week. The problem is your loan officer. And so I called, I called a couple loan officers that I knew. I put her in touch with one of them and they were underwriting, they were underwriting a loan for her um, the next week. So, uh, you know, sometimes you, you want to, you want to, when you're going to, cause I've gone through this process myself being, you know, self-employed over the years as well. And, and I, so I understand, but, uh, but I, you know, I'll, I'll walk into the bank and just start talking to people and say, look, this is where, this is my situation. Is this going to be a problem? When I bought the, uh, the office that I'm sitting in right now, the office that I'm sitting in right now, when I bought this. I, I dealt with a local bank, so they understood local. Uh, uh, they understood, you know, the local real estate market, and uh, I, I went in and said, "Look, my salary is not great, but I've got assets. We've got we've got a family business, you know, and the, I can afford this. Um, but I, I, I need your your help." And so they uh, the the banks looked at the entire situation and. Uh, and they said, you know, uh, they, they were happy to underwrite the loan. We did it in less than 30 days. Um, this was like five or six years ago when nobody was writing loans. It was, it was really tough to get loans back then. Um, they did it in no time flat. And with my case, they actually, they called me a, a couple months later, took me out to lunch and said, you know, we use your case to train our agents on, hey, you know, this is this person doesn't have a typical situation, but there's you know the money's there. There there's the the business that's a family business, everything, and so they train their agents on my loan to get that, that I I use to to purchase the office that I'm sitting in right now. So it, you folks are a network. Use your net use your network like I saw you guys doing at the beginning of the meeting. And, you know, you're trying to get something underwritten and somebody needs to get a little creative. So as you're not doing anything illegal and, you know, you can afford to do what you're doing, you know, work with each other and and fit and get it figured out. Because it's, uh, you, you know, a lot of times local banks for this kind of stuff, uh, they they get it. They get it. You know, they, they understand local markets and, and what you're doing. And, you know, I, I just feel so blessed having that company because then. A couple of years later, I, I, I got a couple of my accountants. I said, I want to buy another office. You folks want to come in with me? And sure enough, we were able to buy another office with that same bank because they got it. They understood, you know, we're, we've been in business for 50 years. We're not going anywhere. There's plenty of money coming in the door. We can afford this. Um, and, you know, so I won't get into any more specifics, but 
But uh, yeah, you know, don't don't go into a, a nationwide, you know, a, a bank that's the that, Bank of America. We have an account with them. We've run plenty of money through them, but God forbid they ever write us a loan for underwrite a loan for us for anything. <laughs> you know, but uh, this local bank, they've they've run, d- done a number of loans for us. And if their website wasn't so terrible, we would move our, our uh, move our checking account over to them. <laughs> hey, anybody else here in the audience? I, I think we got a couple over here on the side. Okay. Are there any tax planning? Oh, go on. Uh, go on. This go on. Go on. Um, I'm a trade in two, and I was born on the Fourth of July, but I'm one marriage. What, so, sorry, I, I, miss, I missed that. I told Linda I was born on the 4th of July. Oh. <laughs> you know, Another I firecracker. Bravo, bravo, <laughs> firecracker. <laughs> Are there any other methods of deferring or eliminating capital gains when you sell a property? If it's abundance had depreciation, make sure the depreciation's been claimed properly. And if it hasn't, it's not too late to claim it then. And also, also make, yeah. Oh, sorry. And also make sure that uh, you know any improve that you know any improvements that you've done. Uh, also, any any costs that you've had to mm-hmm. sell the property to, to sell the property um, or any costs that you've incurred to uh, get the property ready to sell that you've used that to increase your basis in the property when you go to sell it. Okay, there's no other way. I mean, dying is, doesn't seem like a very good option. So, yeah. And if the game's huge, you can do your 1031 exchange. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Usually we say at least $50,000 gain to, to make a 1031 exchange oh. even close to worth it. Right, no, I understand. Thank you. Okay. I just had a question about the uh, when you on the depreciation thing. If you did not take depreciation, then you're subject to that. If you would sell that property, you would be subject to that recapture as if you already did take it. That is correct. That is correct. Yes, sir. You're going to get taxed on any depreciation that was allowed, which means used on your return, or allowable, which means you didn't even use it, and now they're going to make you pay taxes on it. So be sure whoever does your return knows how to fill out a 4757 and do a good job on it. Mm-hmm. Or was it 4727? No, 4797. 90, thank you, thank you. Oh. Hi, hi, Linda. It's uh, David Randolph from Clubhouse. Hi, Mike. Jennifer Hammond. Um, oh! <laughs> we love Jennifer Hammond. Yes, I've been on oh. Clubhouse with Linda. Okay. Yes, my, my 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 Preston's sister Macarena Rose is going to be on her show December fourth with her. Cool. Yeah, I'm the short sale guy, but anyway, my question is about personal tax return, and with you know, uh, like self-employed, if you will, um, I have to file you know quarterly payments on my taxes, uh, and so I'm supposed to file quarterly payments right throughout the year. Doesn't always work out that way. But on state taxes, um, isn't state taxes deductible on your personal tax return? Should I pay my state taxes like by December 31st? It, it, it's a 10% limitation. That's the problem. 10,000, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the past, in the past, if we had a good year, we would uh, we would prepay some uh, state tax in in November and December. But now with the salt limitation that I that I spoke about earlier, um, it, yeah, we don't we don't play those games anymore because usually it it it, it it's not helpful. Uh, I, I guess if if it's a rental property um, and we're prepaying some real estate tax, you could you could do that. Um, but that's only on a rental property that we know that uh, either is going to cash flow positive at the end of the year, or if the rental property is, uh, if it's one where that where you're in a case where you're able to take your losses uh, um, uh, contemporaneously. Thank you very much.
Anybody else? Nobody else in here has one while or are we're waiting for somebody to think of one. I've got one. I've read somewhere that uh, if you've got if you make a you have a traditional 401k and you make a payment directly from that to a charitable uh, foundation that you can take that out without paying taxes on it. That's only if you're over 72 and a half, which of course you aren't. So you have to be over 72 and a half. And if the charitable foundation receives the money directly from your, your 401k, then what happens is that's considered part of your RMD, your required minimum distribution. So um, that's okay. You're allowed to do that. And it, it doesn't mean that you get to deduct the, the charity because you've already deducted it from your RMD. Now, if any of that doesn't mean anything, I'd be happy to explain it in hey, real no, words. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question. Okay, if I, if I can take it out tax-free, can I use it as a deduction on my tax return then? If you no, 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 no. You can't get it. You can't get it. No, but okay. as, as you oh, know, yeah. when you're over, when you're over, when you're over age 72 and a half, and now they're raising that a little bit, um, you must take out, let's say it's like 3% per year of the balance that's in your solo 401k or regular 401k, and also your IRA and everything. But you can have that money dedicated to a church or charity, but you're not going to get a deduction for it. You're just going to save the taxes on what would have been part of your income. But it's a very good thing to do. I have a lot of clients who do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing to do. I just wondered if it could be even better. Yeah, <laughs> I like okay, the way you think. I, I'm with you. Okay. It's, only, it's only when you're over 72 and a half and doing the required minimum. Uh, yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Here? Well, thank you. Thanks for having us. I mean, we we had a good time. This is uh, I, I I think this is the first time we've done this where we did a Zoom to a class before, right? Linda, have you done any this year where you were doing it to a classroom as well? Uh, a class and people, uh, just a couple real estate companies where oh, some yeah. of the people were at the company and some of them some at the office and some at home offices. Yeah. And, and, and it's nice to uh, to to do. I mean, we we do uh, we do stuff uh, oftentimes uh, to people all over the country. But uh, but what's nice about this is uh, is seeing people in an environment that is uh, you know it, it's it's almost like being there in person with you folks with you all in in the uh, with you all in the room there. And uh, it, it's it, it's almost like traveling a little bit. So which is which is nice. <laughs> Yeah, we're pleased with what you really worked out. I was a little hesitant and uh, apprehensive about, <laughs> about doing this, but I uh, know with the crew we got here, we got a great, great uh, technical crew. Uh, it worked out really well. Yeah, yeah. Both along with us. And we hate talking, as you can tell. No. <laughs> I've never, seen the the I've never seen a microphone or a camera that I didn't love. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thanks for having us, folks. And if there's no more questions, I guess we'll uh, we'll log off and uh, and uh, maybe we'll talk to you folks next year. Thank you so much. It's been so helpful and just uh, phenomenal. Thank you, Linda, for tuning in. I know you're on the other side of the world. And Preston, uh, you guys are just so knowledgeable and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you again. No problem. You folks have a good evening. Bye bye. Night night. Take care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go back to bed now, Linda. <laughs> okay. Hey, we still got this room till nine.